how would you like to learn the secrets of two Gama Club award winners on how they have built successful online businesses from almost nowhere to now running multiple seven and eight figure businesses by following the simple fundamentals of life. And let's see how they have used the powerful funnel systems, processes, automation and social media to help their business grow at a different pace. Let's dive into their journey to grasp the strategy, mindset, action plan of how they have done it from almost nowhere to the way up to seven figures. We are going to uncover and pick their brains of the top performing entrepreneurs on this show. How they have done it and how you can do it too. You are listening to The Nikhil Sai, the host and welcome to The Nikhil Sai Show. What's going on? What's going on? Everyone who's actually listening to this podcast right now. First of all, guys, welcome to The Nikhil Sai Show, which is hosted by me, The Nikhil Sai. And guess what's going on today? We're back with another amazing two comma club winners not just winner it's going to be winners this time this is going to be a feast we're not just having one person today but two people who are amazing marketing experts when it comes to the digital marketing space the funnels the e-commerce everything which is going on as a trend right now this is going to be an amazing amazing podcast so make sure to stick around and uh, i personally have a great connection with the people who are actually joining the podcast today i mean this is a very emotional journey. I mean, the guy who's joining today is one of my early mentors. He's helped me to raise my prizes, get me into high ticket stuff and help me understand more on the funnel side. I was like a little newbie who, who, who was trying to figure out the funnels and he was a key part of my journey. One of my early mentors who gave me that push to take my journey to the next level and set things up for me. And I'm, I'm really thankful to have him on the show today. Uh, so the guys who are actually joining this podcast, they have done over $112 million in revenue for the clients. They build hands off, done for you assets for their clients as a service. It's going to be pretty, pretty amazing in case if you're someone who wants to build digital assets, e-commerce is going to be a perfect podcast to listen and take notes and implement on. And these guys are merger and acquisition specialists. So guys, let's not waste any time. And actually, let's have a two comma club winner and another two comma X winner to gather on this podcast today it's going to be a feast so make sure to stick around let's actually welcome alexander olave as well as jeremy michael cmo and ceo at ao elite hey guys What's up? What's up? hey nikhil thank you for having us man Sir. absolutely thank thank you for both of you for actually making this happen i'm, I'm pretty 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 excited for this guys how are you doing today we're doing phenomenal, man. We're excited Good, man. to be here on this on this show, man. You know, you know me. I'm an open book. Jeremy's an open book. So we're, we're <laughs> I'm like a yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, it's gonna be definitely a fun podcast. So yeah, I mean. Alex and my, uh, Jeremy, like we can actually get started with your backstories. Like I know Alex, I know I saw you in a tent. <laughs> that was a pretty crazy time. So yeah, I think it's going to be pretty crazy to share your backstories. Can you please start? Like, how did you start it in this journey? Yeah, absolutely. What, what's really cool, man, is, um, and, you know, I, and I'll get to my story here in a second, but it's like, you, you always want to surround yourself with like-minded people. And I think how AO Elite got to where it is today is just doing that, is really changing the environment, right? Change the environment to have the right mindsets, right? The right mindsets, bring the right skill sets. And like, once I met this guy and heard his story, and we, we can even start with yours, man. I mean, we were both homeless at one point. We both, both lost everything at one point. And I think it's really important for entrepreneurs to really push past that adversity. So Jeremy, do you want to do you want to go ahead and start with yours, man, to, to kick this off? Yeah, so what's interesting, like he said, is we were both homeless at one point, himself living in a tent. Um, I myself had achieved a level of success uh, in the course of coaching business, had made a little bit of money. Um, I lost everything. I had a partner up and walk away with it, got zeroed out, ended up getting evicted from my home. You know, when you start making 30 k a month, 50 k a month, uh, up to 100 k a month, you start to feel like you're the king of your own castle, you know, you control your life. Nothing can stop me. I'm all the way up kind of stuff, you know. Um, so I was at that point. I had elevated and scaled my lifestyle and was um, spending money on things I shouldn't have, you know. But I was also um, had moved into a larger home, was leasing a home. Uh, it was like seventy five hundred a month or something like that at the time. Um, and I was doing great, you know. Well, we had some problems. Uh, I was focused on income and sales, income and sales and competing with everybody. You know, I, I always say all the time that you have to wake up feeling like you have a fight to win. Uh, but what I was doing in the beginning is I thought that fight was that next reward, the next two comma award or the ring or, you know, whatever I was trying to get before um, some of my competitors or, or companions in the, in the online marketing space. Um, I was competing. Right. So I was focused on that and not focused on business admin, not focused on operations. I ended up getting audited by the IRS. 
Um, they tore me up, man. They uh, levied my accounts for like 20 something days. And uh, my partner at the time, who was once my roommate, actually, um, mm -hmm. and I brought him in as a partner because he was so adamant about being a part of the business and wanted to be involved in what I was doing, you know, went into a 50-50 partnership. And uh, did, did it, it's not even related to the partnership that we have now. This is a good, healthy partnership. You know, this was a this was a bad one. And what happened was I woke up on a Monday morning after they unfroze the accounts. He took about three hundred eighty thousand dollars and disappeared on me. Uh, and I haven't seen him since. So I got zeroed out. Let's got, track him down. Got a, I know. <laughs> I'm telling you, got evicted from from the house. You know, I moved into a motel. But what's interesting about my story is I sat in that motel. Uh, for about 30 days, not wanting to do anything. I had no desire, no motivation to get up and do it again. Um, I was eating, throwing up after I ate, you know, just just in a state of depression that I couldn't lift myself out of because I didn't feel motivated to do so. You know, I was like, what's the point of doing this again? But um, what happened was there was a day in that motel when the AC went out, you know, the little units that they have under the windows in the motel mm -hmm. room. He went out. I went to the front and I asked the guy, I said, hey, can you fix this? And he said, I'll send somebody tomorrow to fix it. Well, the problem was it, it was 99 degrees today in Florida, not tomorrow. So uh, I was sweating. It was hot. I was running the shower. You know, the cold water was running in the room uh, just to get the cold steam. Is that even a thing? Cold, yeah. cold steam. Yeah. I thought steam was only from a hot shower. But but yeah, it was like cold mist, you know, coming from the shower in the room. And and the guy comes and he yells at me and he says, hey, you're running the you're running the water too long you know like you're running up my water bill in the room you know because i had the door open so I, I wanted to open the door to let the let any kind of air or breeze flow in because i was hot and I, you know what and i just got pissed off and i said you know what this is it they can you know you can lose money you can lose tools you can lose equipment you can lose everything you have but what you cannot lose is what you've learned so you can't lose your skill set and you can't mm -hmm. lose your, your abilities so um what i did was i sat there and i sweated out a new funnel and that funnel Literally. that I that funnel that I yeah, I literally sweated out a new funnel. <laughs> that funnel that I built while I was sitting there sweating in that motel room um, has now done over 11, 11 million dollars in sales. So hey, and I've got a book coming out called The Motel Millionaire, and it's all about how I built a multi million dollar business from the motel room, you know. Um, and that pivotal moment, I guess, was the moment that I realized, hey, why am I suffering here? Why am I sweating? Because that's one thing I never liked. Right. I don't do a lot of exercise. I mean, the most exercise I get is like getting out of bed, walking downstairs to the kitchen, you know, <laughs> and then walking back up the stairs. Hey, we got a lot of stairs in the house. You know, there's a lot of stairs. So it's more exercise than what you think. And there's a lot of space here. So walking around the house is exercise in itself. But I never like to sweat. So if there was like one thing, you know, that'll motivate me to do something, I guess it would be like, you know, just being sweaty and tired of the situation that I'm in. So I wasn't comfortable anymore because I was sitting there wondering why I was in that position, not wondering why more so blaming myself because I, I, I have always understood that it's easier for someone to blame somebody else for a situation. Mm -hmm. The most difficult thing in the world is to take accountability for what you did yourself and how you played a part in what went wrong. Right. And then fix it within yourself. Right. So that's the most difficult thing that I had to deal with at that point. But fast forward to now, you know, and what got me from that motel room to where I am right now is consistency. Right. Being consistent. Right? A series of small actions in a single direction leads to big wins. So what I mm. did from the day that I was in that motel room has made all the difference in my life. Uh, and it is it has gotten me to where I am and will continue to get me where I'm going. So um, I don't really know a lot about what <laughs> happened, you know, from the time he came out of that tent, you know. Um, I, I definitely feel like it's pain. I think you hit the nail on the head, right? You know, I literally sweat out a funnel. It was, it was it was, the pain of being in that hotel room and really it being hot and knowing that you had the mindset and the skill set to get out. That was really hmm. it. So I'll, I'll kind of give you guys a quick, you know, 30,000 foot over overhead view of, of my situation, right? Um, as a professional fighter in the last 10 years, I got an opportunity to invest in the gym. It was every last dollar that I had, every last penny, and I sunk it in. And I did not know marketing. I did not know sales. I did not know persuasion. Turns out you can be a really good professional fighter, but a really shitty business owner. And uh, I lost everything. Three months later, the doors closed, and I kind of like sunk into self-pity. I had an identity crisis at the time. It's like, man, you were just a business owner. You're not going back to the nine to five. Go move mm. to live in the tent. 
And so I did. And I did that for eight, eight months. And halfway through, it was like some kind of awakening, just bitch slapped me, right? Can I, can I say that on the air? Right? <laughs> um, slapped me and said, you know what? You can take accountability for where you are right now. Go to the library, read everything on marketing, persuasion, sales, influence, read everything that you can. And I did that for the next four months. Um, I did that for the next four months, got a job as a hotel manager, saved up money to buy a car, moved to DC, Ubered and started my first agency. And then from there, it just, just expanded into what is today, which is uh, AOLE. So. Wow, wow, that's beautiful. I think both of your stories has a real, real, you know, internal self-sabotage itself. Like you, you're getting comfortable, sorry, you're not getting comfortable with where you are. You're accepting that you made yourself that situation and you want to get out and you took the consistent actions to get out, which is which is just, you know, I think everyone should do that probably. I think that's a pretty intense story. Thank you so much for a quick introduction, guys. And I think let's get into some AO elite stuff. I mean, you've been scaling this through the roof. So before we get more into like business on how you are built and scale AO elite in a very short period of time, I think we can give a quick backdrop on more about like, you're very intensive on e-commerce. So we'd love to learn more about from you guys who are the experts here, like how to actually start and scale an e-commerce stores. Do you think this is much saturated right now? Or how do you guys look uh, as the expert in the industry right now? I mean, I, I would definitely start and say, when I when I talk to people and they're like, hey, you're an e-commerce, I always change the positioning of it. I say, no, we're a mergers and acquisition firm. Because yes, we build e-commerce stores. Yes, we grow them and scale them. But the whole intention is to exit those businesses. Because if we look at data, if we look at infra infrastructure, the multiples on those are so much more than say a traditional brick and mortar business. So our goal mm -hmm. is to not just build, grow and scale assets. There's to help, they're to help investors really exit those assets. So now they can distribute their wealth in, in other areas of life. I don't you know, I don't know if you want to chime in on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, when it comes to being in a red ocean, being in the red ocean of e-com, right, we do have to set ourselves apart. And the way that we sell our services, like we've, we've put a lot of um, priority on Shopify, you know, as opposed to Walmart automation and, and uh, Amazon automation. Even though we still sell that as a service, we prioritize Shopify because of our ability um, to launch and scale those stores, collecting data for remarketing, retargeting, et cetera. Um, which is more difficult to do with Walmart and Amazon uh, with Shopify. Hmm. You have the ability to um, bring in a buyer, collect the data or information on that buyer, and then leverage it to remarket to that person to increase the lifetime value of the customer, um, as opposed to not being able to collect email addresses on Amazon or Walmart, et cetera. So um, with that, one of the things that we do unique is we have a unique method of selling um, or unique method of selling products in these stores. So uh, what we do is we use dynamic product funnels. So mm. we will take our full store or basically we go through a product selection process. Our product analyst will select hot and trending products. And then we build a brand around those trending products and select congruent products to fill the store. So we select hot trending products first, and then we build the store out with congruent products around it. And then what we do is we take those hot products Right. And we will pull them out and build a single product funnel on the front end. So we take certain products out of the store, build a single product funnel, lead our ad traffic to the single product funnel. Right. That's where the first sale happens. OK, so we pay to we pay to acquire a customer once. And then what we do is we retarget and remarket them back to the full store. So we remove confusion. Like traditionally, you would run ads, lead people to the full store and hope they buy. Mm. Some, right. It's yeah. It's the spray and pray method, right? You, even though you're targeting them, you lead them to the store and you hope they buy something, but they have too many options, right? A confused mind doesn't buy. So what we do with the dynamic product funnels is we're selecting hot products, building out a front end funnel, right? We're creating a single path from point of acquisition to point of purchase, and we're leading a buyer in, in a single direction towards that sale. Once we have them in that funnel, we have the ability to upsell, downsell, cross-sell, uh, and then obviously retarget them back to the full store. So I think one of the things that sets us apart is we sell people on the method of using or leveraging dynamic product funnels, right? Mm. As a passive source of income, because most people will sell the store in the done for you aspect of what you get with the store and the service, right? But they're selling, they're selling pieces, they're selling person and they're selling process. We're not, we're selling the method, right? So we pull that method you know, the dynamic product funnel method out and we sell them on that. And that's what has led us um, to being able to sell a million dollars a month and done for you, you know, automation sales at 35 K a piece. Like we're, we're doing it differently. We're selling them on the method and, and that's, 
and that's kind of what uh, sets us apart, you know, in that red ocean of e-com. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. I'm not sure how many people are getting this, but this is very, very high level talk about marketing and funnels and upselling, cross-selling and whatnot, building a brand overall. I think that was pretty, pretty interesting, guys. So let's get to the next question. This would be pretty interesting and, you know, awesome to answer as well. I mean, you guys have been experts at m and right? You've been doing crazy m and and building businesses, increasing the value and making great exits for your investors so that they can get the maximum output, right? So can we talk a little bit more about like how to actually build a successful business which is profitable and which is scalable, which has worth, which can be valued like 10 times over its revenue? How do you do that actually? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I think when you look at businesses in general, um, what, when you look at a digital model, ultimately it's going to have it, it's going to be positioned better to sell for that higher multiple. So if you look at SaaS companies like Salesforce, they just or uh, Salesforce just bought Slack for thirty seven point seven billion dollars. Why? Mm-hmm. Because they're made on infrastructure. So when we're looking at uh, businesses in the market to evaluate, I would definitely say e commerce holds its value. They're selling at what, like a twenty to sixty x. No, well, actually, on average, right now, the way that they evaluate an e-com store is ten times your average monthly net three months consecutive, right? So if you have a store doing thirty k net a month three months consecutive, that store valuation is three hundred k. They'll buy it for three hundred k. But usually, the seller, whoever it is that's brokering that deal, will add an additional percentage on top of that. So it's selling for a lot more um, than than I would say what it's worth but to them it's worth more because they take it and they scale it the buyer typically will take that store and scale it they want to store um, with products that are already proven you know with products that are already battle tested and selling you know in the data and buyer data and previous data that they can leverage for for audiences and ad sets etc so um, that is the value and, and the value is in the data really it's the buyer data um, there that matters so like I said, one of the reasons why we do prioritize Shopify is because when we sell off that store, we're selling a brand. We're selling a brand with story tied to it. We're selling a brand mm-hmm. with, with products that are selling and trending, but we're also um, selling a buyer's list. You know, we're selling a list of buyers. We're selling a list of um, opt-ins, abandoned carts, everyone who may or may not be interested. And, and that data matters. These days, everything is algorithm run. Right. And the algorithm is much smarter than the human. And we we like to think that we're smarter than the algorithm. We like to guess the type of person that is most likely to buy. But at the end of the day, you upload that data and the algorithm will tell you who is most likely to buy. You know? Yeah. Right? So that is that is a key point there that, you know, that a lot of people in, in when they're new to e-com in selling products, it doesn't matter if it's e-com, digital products, info products, whatever. Right. Everyone thinks that they know better than the algorithm who is the person most interested in your product and they will guess and they'll set all these filters and exclusions and target you know narrow their targeting so much that they miss buyers right yep. and a whole other topic i don't really want to jump into paid traffic strategy right now but um but my point is right mm-hmm. we have, well we have over 110 partners now so 110 stores launched uh, launched and running. And with that, we have an ass load of data, right? So we have buyers, we have leads coming in, we have buyers coming in from all of these stores, you know, mm-hmm. it's a conversation with us. Like we, we've go back and forth about it. We're like, Hey, do we want to package this up for one big exit? Or do we want to continue to scale these brands and flip these stores for our partners and just continue to do that and be more of, like he said, a mergers and acquisitions company. Um, but I do think as we continue to grow, you know, cause we're bring we're bring 20 to 30 new clients a month. If we continue to do that at that rate, you know, by the time we have three, 400 stores, somebody's going to step in and try to swoop us, you know, because there are a lot of guys in the corporate world that are not an e cop and they're like, well, shoot, we have all this capital. We want to be, we want to jump into the e-com business. What better way than to just buy these guys out and already have 400 stores running? You know what I mean? Yeah. No better way than to just use our money to swoop up, you know, three, four hundred stores and and, have, and and already be ahead of the game, you know? So um, that's we know that's coming because we know that um, a lot of people are shifting away from real estate. A lot of people are shifting away from other investment opportunities and, True. and, and looking at digital assets now. Exactly. So, so e-com stores as a whole, you have to think of them as digital assets. So, so we're building our digital asset portfolio. Hmm. And, and at the same time, we're making a lot of people a lot of money um, because we're giving them something that has what we call a QER, a quantifiable end result. 
right? When you mm. invest in crypto and these other things, you don't really have um, that QBR. You track. don't have a quantifiable end result, right? With a digital asset like an e-com store, there's a system and a process to launching and scaling a store and selling products, right? And you have KPIs and you have numbers and you can determine based on you putting a dollar in, whether you're going to get three, five or seven back out. So um, it's almost like we call them S&P systems of mass profit, you know, like an ATM machine, you drop a dollar in, you get three, five, seven back. At that point, how much would you drop into that machine if you were certain of that outcome? Right. So mm. um, it's all a science for us, especially me. I dig deep into the marketing and, and, and funnel strategy side of things. And uh, it's a game. I love the game of business and the e-com business as booming as it is, is just like a complicated chessboard, man. Not that chess, <laughs> not the chess is complicated. I could whoop this guy. No, yeah, I, got <laughs> I, would say, I would say think about it like this, right? Every client that comes into our portfolio, right? Because it is a portfolio of data, it's contributing mm -hmm. to your clients and knowing exactly what's gonna convert from landing pages to you know converting copy to creatives, right? So all of this data becomes a portfolio that we can leverage for each and every one of our clients in this process. So um, I think that's what we're doing differently. I feel like a lot of people in the game, they're, you know, when, when you look at their offers, it's just, you know, kind of what you can do for them rather than what you can do for the client. Right. So um, yeah. I'm really excited where we're going. 2022 is going to be very bright. We've got a lot of, a lot of stuff in the book. So I mean, you guys will just have to <laughs> Yeah, you got a great roadmap. And I think that was a beautiful articulation of all of the knowledge and exact way to actually build a high worth business right there guys i really appreciate the information you're giving away this is very very high level talk guys you need to take notes on and start executing this inside your business like how you can execute the stuff exactly alex and jeremy are actually giving away and let's let's get to the next question this would be pretty pretty interesting i mean i've seen AO lead like from the start like from the day you change your facebook banner to where it's right now and the way it's gonna go to the next level it's gonna it's gonna get that level. You gonna chat about that very, very soon as well, right? That's gonna be exciting. But yeah, like one of the pretty interesting things is that, like, as it's done for you, of course, you have a different offer, like MAs and stuff like that, but you have scaled rapidly, like way quicker than any other people in the done for you space, right? So, how did you actually manage that scale, like rapid scaling as a done for you agency charging premium prices? How did you do that, guys? You know, I, I think that's a great question to kill. And I think it comes down to having great sales and great fulfillment and great marketing on the front. And I just, those three pillars have really changed everything. And just being able to, as a business owner, look at our bottlenecks and see objectively what we need to optimize every single week is what's moving us in that direction. The culture of A players in our business moving towards that direction. And everyone just being so aligned to that vision that it's moving us towards that direction. If that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think a lot of what contributed to rapid growth, you know, and scaling fast is having a back-end team, a back-end sales team so dialed in. They understand the buyer. They understand the person they're selling to. They understand the psychographics of that person, their lifestyle, their interests, their behavior, opinions, attitudes, beliefs, right? Pain points, problems, and obstacles. When you have a sales guy that not only understands that about the person they're talking to, but is also hungry, as I said, they wake up every day feeling like they have a fight to win, you know, and then they shout go, out to Danny, right? We call it, we call it prey drive, right? So mm. prey drive in an animal is the instinctual ability for an animal to see their prey and kill it without thinking, right? Do you think when, let's say a wolf sees a squirrel, he doesn't second guess whether or not he's going to kill that squirrel, right? He just goes to catch it first. Right. So in a, in a human, in us, right, our prey drive is our instinctual ability to see something with our eyes, recognize it with our mind and our heart and have the guts to go get it without second guessing ourselves. Right. Because because animals don't do that. So like in, in prey drive, you know, I don't want to get too deep into it, but it has multiple activators. And one of those activators is, is competition. You know, um, the other one, obviously, is positive gain. Then you have fear of loss and all those other, um, you know, emotional activators that also play into sales itself. But I would say that having a sales team trained, right, having guys on your team, setters and closers, both who have mastered their craft is what has led to the rapid growth. And then they have to be hungry to get it. They have to be making those calls. They have to be following up, right? 80% of the time, it takes 7 to 15 touches 
to close a prospect, the average prospect. And 80 percent of the people that will buy from you won't buy the first time. So understanding that they you have to be fanatical with your follow up. Right. Mm. You have to be aggressive with it, not aggressive in your languaging, but aggressive in in basically in the follow up itself, in your consistency. And that's that's what's made the difference, really, man. I mean, look, at one point we got to a million dollars a month in sales with a still creative on the front end. You know, so you have a still no creative. It's just that. an image. No it's retargeting, just an image. You're running cold ads, bringing people in. Right. But when they get on the phone with that person, it's what they're saying on that call that matters, mm, right? Yeah. It's the rapport, it's the empathy, right? It's the understanding of the problem, okay? And then it's their ability to uncover the value necessary. Value is usefulness. Like a lot of people get confused on what value is. It's utility and usefulness, right? Mm. Basically how the buyer views your product or service, the positive effect that it can have on their life or in their business. Right. So, yes, we speak to the desires. Yes, we speak to uh, the payoff 100 percent. But we talk about the method and how the method relates to that payoff. And that's the biggest thing is like having that script dialed. And it's not even necessarily a, a script per se. Framework. I would say a framework. Right. So you have tactics, you have strategy, and then you have principle. Right. And when you have somebody that understands that if you just teach tactics, that's so surface level that you're not going to be, that that person cannot relate to you and you are not going to be able to sell them. So mm. it's how you implement a strategy. So when we're teaching strategy, we also know that we have to get them to understand the principle behind the strategy. So when we talk about things, and even myself, when I coach things, and the reason I've scaled my coaching business to the level that it's at over 10 million is because I understood that I had to teach on all three of those levels. I had to teach tactics, strategy, and the principles behind the strategy for somebody to truly understand. Right. There are four parts of a person, mind, heart, body and spirit. And if you can appeal to all four parts of a human's nature, when you sell them, you will have no problem selling them. At that point, it's not sales. It's just persuasion. You're allowing them to do something that they already want to do for their reasons, as opposed to convincing them to do something of selfish reasons. So um, there's there's a lot to it, man. But I think <laughs> if, if I had to if I had to look at what we've done, you know, going from like still creative, generating leads and then selling them on the back. And once we knew that the sales team was where it needed to be, right, and was rocking out, then anything that we did to change on the front end, add creative, scripting, building that attractive, like building that, that you know, creating, creating the sales <laughs> message, you know, anything that we did after that just allowed us to scale faster, right? So we went from a still creative to focusing on a sales message, right? Actually having a message that attracts the right people, repels the wrong people, leads them to a VSL that indoctrinates that person into our, not only our belief system, but um, into wanting what it is that we have to offer our vehicle, right? Our vehicle mm. of these done for you automated stores, these done for you Shopify stores, Amazon, Walmart, et cetera. So like once we knew, we kind of validated the offer and we knew that we could sell it with a still creative, everything we did from then on just improved process, improved process. We know we dialed in efficiency. We, we had the back end sales team dialed in before we had the front end figured out. Right. So, and that's interesting because that's backwards from the way most people, most people work their ass off to get the front end sales message figured out. And then the back end is trash. <laughs> so most people, most people, they focus on copy. They focus on all. And, and don't get me wrong. That is super important. Right. But we threw the offer out, got interest and then, had the back end so dialed in that they closed, 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 closed. Were we working harder for that close? Absolutely. And everything that we did on the front end, when we started incorporating pain, problems, desire, opinions, attitudes, beliefs, and all the psychographics of our buyer into our front end sales message, right, to further qualify the individual that was coming in, it made the, it, it made the sales team's job so much easier. Easier, yeah. So much easier. So now they're thankful for what we've done on the front end. Um, and it's allowed us to scale beyond where we thought we were going to be. Um, well, let me rephrase that because we, we know we are going to be much better than we are. I always say, look, we can be 10 steps ahead of most people, but still feel like we're 10 steps from where we want to be. Right? Mm, that's, that's, that's powerful. powerful. Yeah. Russell's going to have yeah. like 20 words in one hand. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. I told him on stage, Russell, if you're listening to this, we're wrestling for charity next year. 
and I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> sure I would appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. I'm pretty excited for him to fight you, and I've seen like Danny and you were having fight, and he was so aggressive, <laughs> right? Like, right? Uh, yeah, that was pretty interesting too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah pre- pretty, pretty interesting, guys. Yeah, that was that was very, very insightful, Jeremy. Thank you so much for giving us so much valuable information on this podcast episode, and. I think this brings down to like uh, dialing into the actual point of actually collecting cash, like having that sales people, like the back end very much ready so that you can build the funds to build a real business. Because once you have the cash, it's not a problem. You can figure out the rest of the part, the infrastructure, the fulfillment process as we, as we speak about. And like one of the great jobs AOL8 has done is actually nailing down, getting the right psychographics of the customer and getting the exact potential customers on the call. I mean, you weed out all the people who don't have the cash. You weed out all the people who are not looking for these types of investments. You weed out the people who are not educated on what you're selling, right? And you've done a great job getting these appointments, like pre-framed appointments of people who are your potential clients, right? Because you know you want a squirrel. You don't want a piece of wood in front of you as you're a wolf here, right? So I think it comes down to getting the right appointments. So like, I mean, you're selling a pretty hyper high degree offer considering, you know, industry standards, people selling Shopify products. It's like very below average on what we're actually doing, right? So can you talk a little bit more about like getting appointments of potential clients? Like how did you successfully manage to be hyper profitable while you're scaling through the roof? I, I think it goes down to being granular on aligning your expectations and really pre-qualifying these prospects because, yeah, they may be a little bit more, a little bit more to acquire as a lead. But at least you know when they do touch the pipeline, right? Because we've got a process. They can, they can go in and book a call. If they don't qualify, they can't even make it to our calendar. So at that point, anything that comes into the pipeline, we know mm-hmm. that you know it's super qualified. From that, uh, you know, from there, our sales teams, they're sharp. You know, our, our sales guys are, are sharp. So they do a great job of piecing it together in the back end with, uh, with their framework. Yeah, so, so on the front, right, um, most of our cold traffic campaigns that are going out are run um, – are basically targeted based on data. So uh, in the beginning, everyone starts with interest targeting. You're targeting different interests to see, or basically mm. I call that like fishing in a pond, you know? Like you have a pond that you know may be interested. There's fish in there somewhere. You're throwing this pole and this pole and this pole and this pole. And then what the algorithm does is whichever one bites first, it prioritizes that area of the pond, you know? Yeah. Uh, like, like there's the fishing hole. All right, now let's, let's deliver every single ad to that area, right? But what we do is once we have buyer data, so based on buyer action, like in the funnel, once we have people who are opting in, once we have people who are purchasing, right, that purchase data, that opt-in data is being fed um, back to the ads manager. We're building lookalike audiences and we're building um, audiences based on user action or buyer action, right? Uh, Then what's happening there is it comes full circle, you know? Every new action that happens in the funnel, every new person that comes in and, and... you know, books a call with us is fueling the fire, you know, Tuting, yeah. audiences. Absolutely. So that conversion data is being fed back and we're, con- we're consistently finding the right type of person. Now I say that's part of it, right? The second part of that is, is it's not just about finding the right person. It's about, as I said, having a message that attracts that person and repels the wrong person, right? One of the things that we do on the front end that's been highly effective is we run ads following a certain format, right? That format I call the preach method. It's P-R-E-A-C-H, pattern interrupt. You got five seconds to catch, less than five seconds to catch their attention in the newsfeed. That's your scroll stopper. You have a pattern interrupt, immediately communicate the reason. So reason and result. So you're communicating the reason, you're talking about the problem, okay? And then you're showing proof of a crazy result. That's what hooks them, okay? So pattern interrupt, reason and result, educate, answer objection, call to action, hope to see you on the inside is the invite, which takes them into a, a VSL, right? That VSL then further indoctrinates them, sells them on who we are, our story, everything else, um, which, by the way, an origin story is one of the most powerful ways uh, to get somebody interested in what you do, because you're literally Mm. talking about how you went from point A to where they want to be or where you wanted to be, which is relatable to where the buyer wants to be. So we take them through that origin story. um, Then we sell them on the method. Right. And make them believe in the method. If they believe in the steps of the process as they relate to the payoff, they will not object to the vehicle that delivers them that payoff, right? So that's what we do. Uh, and then from there, it's not over. They have to go it's through, they have to go through more. They have to go through an application, right? The application is a qualifier. They go through the application, they fill out um, a, a bunch of questions that are targeted questions, mm. you know? And then like he said, if they do not have the money, right? 
if they're not a good fit for us, they don't even get booked on the count. They don't even get added to the CRM, right? They get tossed out. Wow. So if they go to fill out that application and they don't, and they don't fit, you know, if, if they don't fit what we're looking for or I, or ideal buyer, then they're not going to be added to the calendar. We still capture the lead. And sometimes when our sales guys are bored, which they never are, they always got, <laughs> they, they always got qualified leads to, to sell to, you know, but, um, if, if and when they ever do run out of qualified leads, there's a whole list of people who didn't qualify that may have the money now after a couple of months, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, we do capture them, but they don't get added to the CRM or the lists. Um, hmm. calls, I'm gonna move right? So one of the things that helps us there is having, a, having our lead pipeline so dialed in and segmented, right? Our lead pipeline is so segmented down into who qualifies, who doesn't. Right. We have a hot we have a hit list of people coming in for the first time that need to be contacted. After they're contacted, we have a farm club. Right. Then we have a top 25. Right. We separate the bluegills from the blue marlins. We take out the big fish. You know, after talking to them once, we know whether or not they're a big fish most likely to buy. We separate mm -hmm. those individuals, put them in the top 25 or the hot list. And then um, some of our best closers prioritize um, on the hot list every day. Uh, so that, that's kind of like, and, and we dial it in that much. And then, and then basically we just have a hungry team, man. Like, yes, do we assign leads? Yes. We assign leads every day, but after that closer is, has spoken to their assigned leads, they just go attack the list. Right. Cause there's, there's a massive amount of other people there, you know, that may buy or that most yeah. likely will buy if they're contacted. And so one of the things that, that we've really been adamant about is staying on their ass, you know, number one, about being hungry, but two, about follow up. You know, uh, we know that two to three percent of people are innovators. They convert daily. Right. Mm. So those people are, are people who make decisions right away. They're fast thinkers. Right. Uh, then you've got about 13.5 percent of people who are early adopters. They need to see things three to five times. Right. Then you've got early majority, 34 percent of people that need to see things five to seven times, late majority, seven to 15 times. Right. And then 16 percent of people that will never buy. But that's called the law of diffusion. If you want to look it up, it's it's a statistic based on the way people make decisions. Right. So it's a bell curve. And what it'll show you is that the majority of people that will buy from you and make that decision to go all in with you and your company, about 80 percent of those people will buy if they're contacted or if they're if they hear or have seen you that many times, right? Mm. So, so it's a, it's a, again, it's a math game. And once we, once we taught the sales team that once they understood that they were like, yeah, you're right. We're only following up two times. And then we're, and then we're prioritizing the new leads that are coming in because they're always going to be looking for the new opportunity instead of looking at how much money they have sitting in the pipeline. Right. So we, we're just very at, we drill this into the team every single day, into the sales team. And we're like, listen, the average salesman falls off after two follow-ups. And that's ridiculous when you know that 80% of your sales will come from people who need to see things three to five times if, if, or three to 15, you know, you've got three to five, five to seven, seven to 15. If everybody after three touches is 80% of your sales, then why would you fall off after two? <laughs> you know? Wow, that's ridiculously simple. <laughs> so, so that's that's a big part of it, you know. And, and and I can't stress that enough. It's like the majority of our sales come from fanatic follow up. <laughs> wow, that's a very very insightful conversation, guys. Pretty 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 deep overview of what you've been doing, how you've been selling, very very intensive high ticket stuff throughout the roof using this exact strategy. Appreciate you, Jeremy, for completely well, laying say, out this. I always story. say when you can, you can tell whether a person knows what they're doing or has the experience that they say they have when they open their mouth. So <laughs> <laughs> That's on point, yeah. I think everyone can claim, but the people who can only articulate in simple words can actually prove that they know what they're claiming, right? I think that's a really, really powerful saying. Appreciate that, Jeremy. And, and one of the things like, you, you, you guys have been really intensive on is high ticket. I mean, everyone talks about high ticket, your high ticket closer when you charge over $1,000. Uh, like, is that really high ticket comparing to you? Oh my God, nah, nah, nah. That's not the conversation we're having here. I mean, you're kind of projects, right? If you have three paying customers, that's a six figure day for you guys. 
Ah, mm-hmm. what a game changer, right? I think that brings you to the next level question here, which is like the high ticket mindset and offer to create this type of high ticket offer. Can you dissect like the mindset you need as an entrepreneur to charge? Like they need courage internally to say even that price when you're on a sales call, right? So how to get that mindset at the same time, like how to dissect their offers where people can say, oh, that's overpriced or, in, you know, inflated, like what you're saying, right? I could get it done in five or like Shopify is easy, like all of that crap. Like how do you cut short that and make it on point? You know, I, I feel like it comes down to really quantifying the value in the offer, right? I feel like anyone can sell anything for any amount of money. It's, is the value justified to the buyer? He talks about this amazing story about orange juice. I mean, I don't know. You, you, might, you <laughs> might have to share the orange juice story. Here. I don't want to tell you. It's not relevant. <laughs> but really quantifying the value of the goods that you're selling. So I feel like a lot of people are selling themselves short or even the way that they're structuring offers, right? I see a lot of agency owners have the infrastructure that their clients need and they're charging a front end and a retainer, but there's really no equity on the back end. Well, if you could get mm. them where they wanted to be, shouldn't you deserve a little slice of the cake? And if you could do that True. with multiple businesses in the market, everybody would win. Everybody would exactly. win. So, um, yeah. I, I think people doubt their own ability to deliver a return that's 10 times what the ticket price of what they're selling. You know, I think the reason why people don't raise their prices in anything, whether that be coaching or whether that be, you know, a done for you service. And number one, I, I feel like a done for you service should always be higher ticket. Anytime you have, anytime you have more time commitment into something, you know, when I build out my value ladder, my core offers are courses, you know, they don't require any of my time. And then as we move up the ladder, time commitment increases, whether I'm on a coaching or like a coaching call or whether I'm, you know, doing one call a week or whether I'm doing one-on-ones with that person or whether it's a done for you service, like what we're doing with AO, right? Mm -hmm. As the time commitment increases, so should, so should the price, right? Because the level of value increases. Okay. And I don't think that people understand. I see, I see a lot of people that come to me and they say, well, if I raise my prices, I can offer this and offer that. People think that if they add more pieces to the equation or if they add more time, one of the biggest mistakes that coaches make is they will think that the more money they charge, the more time they have to give to that person. Right. And people don't want more time with you. They want results because until you've, delivered, exactly. until you've delivered them a result, they don't care about how much time they're spending with you. In fact, we live in what I'm we fine. call the current of the urgent. Everybody wants everything done faster. So if, you can shorten, so if you can shorten the amount of time that you deliver them that result, then it becomes worth more than you saying, hey, for um, $30,000, I'm going to give you six months of this. Right. Well, how about for thirty thousand dollars? I'll give you this result in two weeks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now it, that may or may they not pay be fifty for that. But it, but if you can accelerate their time, right? That's a big one for people because ultimately in life, everybody wants to make the money they need to make to be able to buy back their time. Right? They don't want to pay thirty thousand dollars for something that's going to take six months to do. Hmm. Right? Now, one of, things, one of the things about our about the done for you offer is understanding that it does take you know, um, several months to get a store to a level of profitability that's consistent, right? And we make them under, and we make them understand that when we're selling them. But we also say that typically we scale these stores a lot faster than that because it's in our interest to do so. If we're partners, exactly. if we're partners on the back end, then it's in both. We have mutual interest in scaling these stores as high as we possibly can, as quick as we possibly can for the revenue that's generated on the back end. Right. But I think when it when it comes to selling high ticket, people just got it. People got it wrong. They got sales wrong in general. Right. And, and that's the big thing is they don't they don't. Number one, they don't understand what they're selling in general, because if they truly if they truly themselves understood the value of what they were selling, hmm. then they would know, like I know that I should be charging way more for our service. You know, we're not charging enough. <laughs> you know, you, you know what I'm saying though? Like, like if I if I know because I've done it several times over and over and over again, am capable of building you an asset that generates six to seven multiple seven figures, right? Then why why would I limit myself to only charging you thirty thousand dollars when I know it's going it's going to potentially bring you six, seven, eight figures? Yeah, so it's way more than you can actually put now, the number I will on. Say this, I will I will caution some of you. 
I will caution some of you to not raise your prices and charge 50K if you're not capable of doing that for someone, because that's what gets people into hot water. What gets you into hot water is when you say, I'm going to charge you 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars and you can't deliver because you don't have the knowledge or you have not walked the walk and battle tested your abilities enough to know that you can deliver a 10x multiple. Right. If you can't deliver that to them, then charging that much is going to get you, you know, in, in some hot water and it's going to lead to complications. You know, so that that's kind of like and I know you got a lot of guys out here who are teaching and preaching, you know, through the value ladder. Forget about the low front end products. Go high ticket, go straight high ticket. And yes, you are right. You know, we sell we have to sell less people. We sell three people. It's a six figure day. And that's unfathomable for some people. Right. But understand that we didn't start with that. Right. Mm. That, right. Until we got to a point to where we, we mastered our craft. Right. To be able to justify charging that. OK. So I would say if, if you're a beginner and you're listening to this right now, this podcast and you know something like it's not enough to, to think, you know what you're doing. Right. Because a lot of people stack what they know on what they know and what they know and what they know and they get by and they make money. Right. But they haven't mastered any of it. OK. You can make if you master one skill, your primary skill, you can make a million dollars easy in a primary skill. Right. With one primary skill, you can get one of these awards right here. Right. Wow. But, but to sustain and maintain that, to bring in another million and to scale beyond from one to ten, you have to either learn how to master your secondary skill or mm -hmm. multiple secondary skills or find somebody and bring them into your situation who has mastered those secondary skills. Right. So the, and if you don't have that in place, right, let's say your primary skill is sales, because this happens a lot. You have a lot of people who are good at sales and they can close a thirty thousand dollar deal. But then what happens? There's no fulfillment. There's no delivery. There's no anything on the back end. So I would, I would caution you, right? If you know that you are worth more than what you are charging, raise your prices and don't look back. Right? Raise your prices and don't look back. I remember the first time that I started selling a high ticket offer because I, I launched, you know, in the online business, you know, back in 2016. And I was selling a 997 offer like everybody else. You know, the, the thousand dollar offer, that's like the main price. And everybody's like 997, you know, thanks to Russell Brunson. Uh, everybody's, <laughs> everybody's like 997 and then I'll. It's then a breakout. I'll, I'll upsell, I'll upsell, right? So um, I started with that, you know, and I made a decent amount of money doing that. And I remember the first time that I sold a high ticket offer of, of 20K plus, 25K plus, I was like, wow, it's so much easier to sell somebody with money than it is to sell somebody without it because people with money, money's not an objection. True. Right? Yeah. So when I say when I say what is your buyer's main objection, and somebody says money, I was like, you're wrong. <laughs> right? Because for people with money, money's not an objection. Right? They care about the value. And you and if price is the problem, then you have an uncovered value. Right. So I will say this, and this is why I, I caution them about this, is because it's easier to sell people high ticket, right? But it's unethical to do so if you cannot deliver on a 10x multiple. Point. Mm, wow, that was pretty, pretty powerful, Jeremy. Appreciate you going to very in detail on how to actually build an offer for high ticket and how to get the courage and how to look at your own fulfillment systems and you know raise your prices or understand the right price to you know uh, charge for your clients. That was pretty intense, brother. That was interesting. So let's get to the next question. Uh, we would love to get into the tech stuff, like what kind of tools, CRMs, follow-up systems you use when you're becoming a wolf in the sales game. So overall, like to run the AO Elite, like what kind of tools you use to manage your projects and clients for productivity? Yeah, I mean, it's, it doesn't get real complicated on the software side, right? We've got Notion on our project management, setting up Zaps to communicate with Slack. So now the team knows what's going on internally um, and then mm -hmm. high level to go ahead and manage the CRM, right? Um, it, it doesn't have to be complex. As long as you've got a system that works for you, I know a lot of people get really geeked out like, oh, my God, do I need this system? Do I need that system? No, keep it simple. If it's effective and it's working, just just scale it out. Yeah. And you know what's funny is a lot of people will go through, you know, what we call shiny object syndrome, where every new software that comes out, all the bells and whistles that the software does, they're like, they're like, oh, but if you download this software, you get this feature and you get that feature and you get this and this and that. You know, one of the greatest things I ever did, you know, 
that had the, the greatest impact on the scalability of my, my funnels and my business is simplifying the process, removing all the bells and whistles. You know, mm. all you is a constant flow of, uh, of traffic, right? You need a selling system. So you need a funnel, right? To funnel that traffic through. And you need a presentation. You need to be able to deliver them a presentation, whether that be a VSL or a webinar um, or a free training, whatever it is that you deliver them, you have to have that. You, but you do not need all of these crazy bells, whistles, automations. You have to have the ability to track. That's important, right? So you have a constant flow of traffic, your ability to track that traffic and retarget that traffic, right? But that, but that's it. And then, and then just have your selling system dialed in. Like we literally removed all of the, the crazy webinar software, like webinar jam, ever webinar, go to webinar. I've used them all and removed them all. Right. Because I found it much easier to just embed a video into a funnel page, <laughs> take, take the video, embed it into a funnel page, and let them watch it, you know, and they're sold on the message, you know, they're sold on the message. Not, I mean, they're, they're just so, look, I get it. Right. Those software guys got to make their money too. <laughs> 22. So when I removed all the clutter, you know, because think about it, you, you spend you can spend your day logging into six or seven different platforms or you can spend your day logging into into two. Right. Your funnel and your CRM <laughs> and make the same amount of money or more that's money, what, basically. That's what matters. And then when you have your sales team hungry and dialed in and they're logging into the CRM for you, you don't even really have to log into that. You know, <laughs> I don't the CRM because I know the sales team is attacking it. And whenever I do look at it and I see that they're not attacking those leads. Then it's a different conversation, you know. <laughs> you attack the sales team. <laughs> but I have I have traffic. I have Facebook, IG, YouTube ads, right? Simple funnel system with an embedded video, no crazy bells and whistles. Okay, the ability to track and retarget that's important, and then a mm -hmm. CRM. <laughs> Perfect. And that and that really is all you need. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Do we, Sounds do like we, a complete do, plan. Do we incorporate SMS? Yes, we do. For mainly for retargeting. You know, do we have automated email sequences? Yes, we do. I believe the more you add to your sequence, the more you're going to sell, the more money you're going to make, right? So we do have those things in place. But again, with a software like ClickFunnels and high level, so to answer your question of what we use, even though we usually charge for that, yeah. <laughs> we run ads on Facebook, IG, YouTube, um, et cetera. We do omnipresent retargeting on all platforms, but we're mainly... Click funnels, right? Click funnels to high level. Uh, we high level doubles as our CRM and and our auto response. You know, so we do a lot of um, automated follow up through high level and CRM stuff, uh, obviously through high level as well. So um, those two, and then all the ads platforms really is is all we That's have. It. Any any special analytic platform used to kind of track on all the well, data? So, so because yeah, because of iOS fourteen, you know. Messing up tracking, pixel tracking. Yes, we have Hyros, we have Segmetrics. So, uh, and Leadsbridge as well, we utilize. But even um, then, it's still not clean, right? Even then, even then, it, even then, it's still not clean. It's still not clean, you know? But at the end of the day, it is what it I, is. <laughs> at, at, at the end of the day, man, because we sell high ticket, like, even if we find ourselves spending a couple thousand dollars to acquire a customer and we sell them on 35. Don't burn out. Well, you know, and the true data is going to be in the CRM. That's going to let us know exactly right. how many calls, right? How many calls came in, how much ad spend we had. We, I mean, and we, we do, do our, our attribution is, our attribution is dialed in, but you know what, you know what I focus more on? I focus, honestly, I focus less on like KPIs and numbers and more on message, right? I focus mm. more on the sales message, dialing that in, continuing to create ad creative, different ad content with different hooks and angles, you know, um, then I do focus on KPIs and in, in numbers in the ads manager. I feel like marketers, you know, they put more focus on mechanics. They put more focus on the mechanics and more focus on the numbers than they do the actual message. Right. And that, mm. that's the problem. Right? And that's the reason why they're not selling, you know, at the rate or the level that they want to be selling at. Yep. Sounds like complete action plan, Jeremy. Appreciate you going into the tech stuff and explaining everything you're actually doing to get traffic and get appointments. That was pretty interesting. And yeah, I think let's get into more general questions about, you know, uh, in person about you guys. So yeah, any, any million dollar routines? How does that look like for you guys? 
million dollar routines. I don't know. Cinnabon. <laughs> Cinnabon, the the Cinnabon which, is totally, which is totally not good for you. Um, look, I'll tell you something <laughs> that's helped me when it comes to goal setting. You know, uh, I do believe in OKR structure, objectives and key results and goal setting uh, both on a on a team level, management level, um, team member level or individual level as well. Uh, when you get granular with those OKRs and you set those goals, right, then they then they trickle up. Right. So if an individual completes their goals, if all the individuals complete their personal goals, then that team completes its goals. If that team completes its goals and that department, you know, completes its goals, the department completes its goals, then then the overall company completes their goal. Right. So I believe in that. But one of the things um, that keeps me going is I'm the type of person if I let's say I map out 10 things, 10 goals for the day, like if I'm setting daily goals and I map out 10 things. Um, I'm the type of person that if I cross off six of those 10, if I do six and I cross them off or cross off seven, I'll start to feel like I've done enough to stop for the day. It's like, oh, mm. I looked at it. There's six out of 10 things crossed off or seven out of 10 things crossed off. It's like, I didn't get everything done, but I did a lot, you know? So psychologically, when I see that I've done seven out of 10 or six out of 10, I start to feel like I've done enough to slow down or to slack. So what I do is I'll write my goals out on a whiteboard, right? Let's say 10 things that I want to do for that day. As I complete a task, instead of crossing it off, I erase it and replace it so that every time I look at that board, it looks you like have so much things to do. It looks like I've done nothing. Right. <laughs> every, every time I look at the board, it looks like I've done nothing because when I complete one, I erase that was it. a great hack. So it's a little mind hack. Right. It keeps me going. Um, it, I never get that sense of fulfillment because I'm like, I haven't done enough yet. For the day or haven't done anything for the day rather um, <laughs> my board is still loaded with things to do. There's always something to do right if anybody sits back in their business and they're saying there's nothing i can do today to grow my business they're lying to themselves yeah right. yeah that was intensive that was intensive thank you so much for the mind hack jeremy that was definitely interesting let's get to the next question i mean you guys have your journeys have been inspirational you went from great level of the business to where you are becoming homeless to now again building multi-million dollar businesses if there is one suggestion you can give to a 20 year old yourself what will that suggestion look like 20 year old self holy shit mm. um stay true to your vision don't listen to the naysayers a lot of people are going to tell you to don't do it you shouldn't do it you can't do it for me throughout my entire 20s that was the sign that i should do it because it was breaking out the confines of what normal reality would consider as life. So anytime mm. you're out of the confines, you're going to face resistance. And if, if you're hitting that resistance, you know, you've hit a point that as soon as you break past it, that's uh, you're opening the clear. So that's what I would tell myself. Yeah. Just, just keep going. Yeah. How about, how about you, Jeremy? What, what would be your suggestion to 20 year old Joseph or someone just getting started? Hmm. Well, I would tell somebody, number one, to get really clear about what it is that they want, right? And then how they are going to um, take what they want and solve a problem for somebody else with that, right? So get clear on what it is that you do and how it solves a problem for somebody else. And then get clear on the person that it solves a problem for, right? And then craft a message to articulate your solution to their problem. One of the, one of the things that I would go back and probably another thing that I would go back and probably tell myself now is to focus on mastery. Mm. Right? Mastery is your ability to execute on something effortlessly without the use of conscious resources, right? We tie our shoes. We don't have to think about it. We brush our teeth. We don't have to think about it. Right. So, and, and again, it goes back to what I said earlier, when you know something or you think, you know, it, you stop learning. Okay. So one of the things that you should be focused on in one area at a time, it's very important, one area at a time, focus on mastery, you know, focus on knowing so much about what it is that you are trying to learn that you can do it effortlessly without the use of conscious resources. And then once you've mastered that, move on to the next um, skill set or requirement in your business to grow like for example i i focused on paid traffic mastery first and then i went into copywriting and i went into email marketing and i went and i and i jumped into you know wow. uh, funnels and automations and and i mastered one at a time and then i stacked mastery on mastery on mastery on mastery right so 
um, I would say focus on mastering one thing at a time and get so good that even when you yourself know you're operating at a level four, everything, everybody else thinks you're at a 10, right? <laughs> so that, that's when you know you're good. When, when you yourself feel like you're at a four, everyone else thinks you're at a 10, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's how you become a grandmaster. Yeah, appreciate that, Jamie. That was so insightful. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, brother. Let's get to the next question. Your life's biggest achievement so far and any next bigger goals, milestones you want to hit? Ooh. Man, I haven't. I feel like I haven't even scratched the surface. I mean, we, I mean, you can rack up all the achievements, and I, I just honestly feel we haven't even scratched the surface. There's so many things ahead of us. That, uh, you know, I, I'd like to do a lot more humanitarian things. You know, once once that's once that's in the works, then I, then I'll feel accomplished. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, I've shifted in my personal life to more impact-driven goals. So you have income-driven goals and impact-driven goals. You know, now that I've met all of my income driven goals, the focus is on impact because um, ultimately impact is more important than income. Right. So we're all looking to leave a legacy. Right. Mm. We don't when we die, we don't want somebody getting up, you know, to give the eulogy and say, well, he was a great guy. No, I want them to have a whole list of things that I've done, you know, to help people. I want to have a whole list of of people that I've helped and impacted and lives that I've changed. So, you know, impact driven goals are more centered around people and less centered around profit. Right. So I've made my money. Right. I'm not motivated anymore by the ring, by the award, by the next trophy. You know what I'm motivated by now is the mass amounts of people that I'm helping. In the beginning, I was selling, you know, I'm still selling a lot of courses. But when you sell a course, somebody buys your course from Canada, Montreal. They buy it from Alaska. They buy it from New York. They buy it from Texas. They buy it from Chicago. They go through that course. And though it may impact them and help them in their situation, I don't feel the impact of that unless they tell me. So mm. unless they're sitting at their home on their own time going through my information, and if, and if they take action on it and they get a result, if they tell me that result, right, it's impactful, but it's not as impactful as being in front of people, speaking to large rooms of people, you know, um, meeting with people personally, working with them, getting to know them and their families, right? And seeing growth, seeing and feeling growth for yourself is more motivational than the cha-chings in the morning from, from Stripe or from Shopify Pay, you know, seeing those <laughs> things come through, you know, like small, small-minded people now, think that money is their motivation but they'll soon realize once they make it that their motivation is less about money and more about the people that they're impacting and when you when you skip that part when you focus on money and you don't focus on um impact then you get to what you would call the top and you start to feel alone where you are yeah. right so I got to a point in my life where I had I had made enough money to be comfortable. I could sit back and go live in Tahiti for the rest of my life and not do anything, you know, but it's lonely at the top when you're there and you realize that you're there alone because you pushed everyone away to get there. Right. Mm. It, it's a hard it's a it's a hard feeling. Right. It, it, that's that's a hard internal fight. True. You know? So yeah. I, I can tackle all of my external problems. No problem. It's the internal, it's the internal fight. That's the problem, you know? Yeah. Uh, so that, that would be, you know, the biggest thing for me is I have shifted all of my focus more to impact and serving. Um, and I know that sounds cliche and a lot of people say, Oh, I'm just about serving others, serving others, you know, but at, at a certain point it hits you, you know, it's like, I, and, and to be honest, I made five, six million dollars before it hit me. You know? So before it hit me, I, I had made the money. You know, I was I was living like Jordan Belfort. You know, I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing that was he's, powerful. He, hey, look, I'm not saying he's a guy that doesn't care about impact because I I know now that he cares. You know, he definitely cares about impacting others, uh, and he's changed a lot of lives and helped a lot of people. I'm just being funny here. But, um, you know, I, I was living that lifestyle, uh, a lot of fake friends, a lot of fake people around me that were there for money. You know, it's like you're, you're buying um, status, you're buying status, you're buying your circle. You know, it's like you're you're because you're paying to play. Everyone's playing with you, <laughs> you know, but at a certain point, it's like there's no substance to this. There's no there's no heart in this. I'm not feeling it. I, I need to back up. I need to. Um, 
reorganize my mind, you know, wow. and, and start doing something that matters to me more than mm. um, doing something for money. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that was really, really powerful, guys. Appreciate you mentioning that. I think that's real. Like once you accumulate all the money required, once you solve all the money problems, you'll be left with problems which money can't solve. As you mentioned, that inner feeling you need as an entrepreneur to keep moving on, right? That was beautiful. And as entrepreneurs, you don't consider mistakes as mistakes. But looking back, like, what do you think is like the biggest mistake in life, like the biggest learning curve you had in your career, you know, as marketing experts? I think the biggest mistake was not starting soon enough. I think it was waiting until I was 27 years old to actually make a move and do something with my life. I feel like had I told myself at 20 years old to, to press the fucking go button and don't look back, <laughs> you know, we'd be in front of the day. But, you know, it is what it is, and the universe has its own timeline. And all the experiences, everything that's been learned along the way, I would not trade it for the world, you know. Hmm. Now, see, that's, that's an interesting question to me because I don't consider anything that I did to be a mistake. You know, I just look at it as a misstep, you know, like I stepped off of the path. I stepped in the wrong direction and I pivoted mm. and, and I pivoted and I corrected, you know, and if I stepped wrong and I tripped and fell on my face, you know, then I had to get up and step back onto the path or into the right direction that I was moving in. And, and sometimes you start walking a certain way and you don't realize that the way that you're walking is off you know, off path or not in line with where you want to be or want to go, you know, and I believe everyone has to take those steps, though. I believe everyone has to step off in the wrong direction to realize where the right one is, because if you don't know what if you don't know what's wrong, how do you know what's right? Mm. You know, and, that, and, that's a, and, and that's something to chew on there is like if you, if you don't know the wrong way, how do you know you're going the right way? You had a philosophy master here, like <laughs> so many proverbs, like that's so insightful. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, I, like I said, I just don't see them as mistakes. You know, people are like, oh, I made a mistake, you know, but what does the word mistake mean to you? It's you a know, mistake. a mistake, a mistake, yeah. right. Like you missed an opportunity. And I don't think I, I don't think I ever missed an opportunity because as soon as I stepped in the wrong direction and realized I was in the wrong direction, I just went back to what I knew was right. You know, I would I would call it a delayed opportunity. Mm. You know, a mistake is just a, make a, a, like, fuck. a mistake is a delayed opportunity. You know? <laughs> the it's like you heard it you, you didn't you didn't lose it. You know, I, I would say, you know, like some would say that. You know, I made a mistake with taxes. And as a result, I lost all of my money. You know, I got it levied. My partner got mad, stole all my money. People would say, oh, that was a big mistake in my life. It was a misstep. It wasn't a mistake. Because at the end of the day, it if had that not happened, I would have not sweated out that funnel in that motel room. I, I would have not built that funnel for that course that generated $11 million. That would not yeah. have been a thing had I not stepped in a different direction true right yeah, these, these steps are crucial in that different direction that would not be a thing so so no i i don't think that a mistake is something that holds you back i think it's just a delayed opportunity hmm. yeah that was pretty insightful guys again that was pretty pretty interesting i mean you guys are dropping so much value let's get to like one last question before we wrap this up your main inspiration for success and the key people involved in your journey i mean you look like leveling up lifestyle differently it's pretty interesting to see you guys rolling up. So what really motivates you to show up and stay ahead in the course? I would say our people. I would say my biggest motivation is our people and our internal workers. We have about 35 growing every day, 30, about 36 in-house employees right now. And they motivate wow. me every single day to show up. Because if I don't show up, if we don't show up, we're not showing up for them. We're not showing up for our clients. So to me, that is that that would be my biggest. And, and that's the same for me because self motivation for me is something that that I've always struggled with. You know, if I feel like I'm doing it for myself, I won't do it. If I feel like I'm doing it for others, I'll do it. You mm. know, if I'm doing it for somebody else, I'll do it. Right, because I don't want to let them down. Right. So you when you, for them. you surround yourself with the right team, and you're doing it for them, and they're doing it for you right? You feed each other's fire. And I think yeah. that's 
Absolutely. And I think that's what, uh, in, you know, unfortunately in, in a team atmosphere, like we have 42 staff, you know, I think 44, 40, shit, yeah. 44 now, I think, you know, um, and with that, <laughs> with that team, you will, you will have individuals from time to time that will start to show you their colors. They'll start to show you that they're not there for you. Right. Mm. Um, that they're not there for you, but they're not there for the others on the team and they're just not aligned with your vision. So you have to cut those people out. And I, and I think one of the problems that most people face with scaling teams and having those people around them all the time is they get, to cut them. They, they get attached to what's toxic. You know, mm-hmm. they get attached to people to get close to people and those people are dragging, dragging down team morale, yeah. dragging down the culture and the team. And so um, I'm going to be honest, like there's been a couple of in- instances where we've had people like that, that were toxic. And I lost all motivation because I was dealing with toxicity, you know, mm. and I have to surround myself with people who are just as hungry as I am for, for me um, to lead them in the right direction. You know what I mean? It's like when, when somebody pushes me to lead them, I'll lead them, you know, and then sometimes I'm pushing them to be led. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah, I mean, I think we, I think we should talk about this like a little more. Like every entrepreneur kind of does this hire, and they're emotionally attached to this person, and they cannot like deal that situation to kind of let them go, right? Like, like us high level entrepreneurs who've been having a players in your team, right? Like, you know, with a small team of forty people, you're doing multi million dollars, the crazy stuff, right? You know, a you have a players, right? Like, how do you let go of these people? Like, when you know these guys are not for you, not for the company, not for the vision you're building. Like, how do you deal with that situation? Like, it's a personal question, by the way. I think it's understanding business is business and that other people are relying on, you know, this toxic person either being in the process or not being in the process. And the longer that that toxic person stays in the process, the more it's affecting the overall morale on the team. Because it it can either Mm -hmm. happen the top up or the bottom up, or sometimes it happens, you know, both. One, One of the things that I do is I don't make the decision myself. I talk to my team about it. Mm. I talk to my team and, and when you do that and when, and when you find out, you know, that you talk to the team and, and none of the other team actually clicks with that person, buys with that person or wants them there, then it's like, okay, yeah, now I'm, now I'm certain that, that this person has to go, you know, and I'm not, and I don't do that to try to create, you know, a bunch of drama within the team. I don't say, Hey, tell me what you think about this person, that person, blah, blah, blah. You know, but if we have an issue, we definitely address it with the team and they and they give us their concerns. You know, one of the things that I do um, that I got from Judge Graham and Matt Monero, you know, is they do 911 meetings every morning. You know, uh, basically what that means is, you know, at 911 every morning, they they address issues and problems from the previous day. Mm. So they have one, one meeting where they start off by addressing issues and problems from the previous day, and then they talk about objectives and key results for that day as well. So um, during that time, it's the time for the team to step forward with their concerns, to step forward with any problem. And and we were very transparent with it. And and I and I've done that and it, it helps. You know, like when you when you give the team, because what'll happen is team members will come to you and they'll say, you know, I just didn't want to say anything because I felt like you were such good friends with that person. Or I felt like you were so close to that person that I didn't want to say anything to jeopardize my own position. Yeah, that's real. So that's what happens is you can have, you know, a toxic person in, in the company and nobody wants to tell you that that they're doing wrong because they don't want to jeopardize their own position. So so we have like an open door policy where it's like, listen, you you can come to me or come to Alex and you can speak to us about anybody at any time. Are we going to go share that? No, we're not going to go share it with everybody because we don't want to bring down team morale, but we're going to understand it. And we're going to take that into account when we're making our decisions moving forward. Hmm, that was very, very insightful and powerful. Appreciate you giving that information away. I think you guys are so insightful and like the top experts here, who's going to kill it and going to kill it continues. It's going to be amazing guys uh, to, to be a part of your journey for sure. So let's say if someone is interested to be a part of AO lead, wants to build some systems and process, like where can they find you mentoring? Yeah, absolutely. I would just say right now, go to aoelite.com. We've got a mastermind that will be coming out in January. Uh, just pay attention to the Facebook for that. But, um, but yeah, I would say for now, go to www.aoelite.com and uh, book a call. Get out, I would book say, a call. I would say it's really easy, guys. You pull out your <laughs> card, right? <laughs> you pull out your card. And I'll tell you this. I can't help you till you commit. But once you commit, I won't let you fail. 
<laughs> that was powerful. Yeah, appreciate you guys. So guys, make sure to check out aoelite.com to build hands off done for you digital assets for yourself and build fortunes for yourself. That's going to be pretty interesting. And guys, it was so insightful conversation to have both of amazing people on this podcast today. Any last word before we conclude the podcast session for today? I would say get out there and go implement, guys. Take anything that you've heard of value from this podcast episode and go implement it in your own business. Um, you know, it's gotten us to where we're at, and I hope that maybe you know, I hope that you guys get value from it as well. So, absolutely. I just want to appreciate you guys for listening. For those of you who are here, I know a lot of you will be listening after this is posted. Um, so, I don't know if they're here live or here on the replay. I don't know, but um, we're glad you're here, anyways. Uh, and if you have any questions for us. You can reach out to us. Uh, you can find us on socials easy. easy. Alex, Alexander Olave, Jeremy Michael, we're there. Um, the crazy guys, you know. <laughs> you'll, you'll see us doing crazy stuff like boxing in the back yard. <laughs> traveling all over the place. We, we tend to be in different, different times all the time. But um, Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that was that was interesting. So, guys, this is it for today. Again, once again, Alex and Jeremy, appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for this amazing opportunity. It was definitely a very, very powerful podcast episode, one of the best value ever a you know, guest actually delivered on the show for sure. This is very insightful. So, guys, make sure to take notes, start implementing as just Alex concluded. And stay tuned for the next interview, guys. I'm going to be coming back with another amazing guest just like Alex and Jeremy. So, hope you enjoyed the podcast session for today. If you need any more help, check out AO Elite. And we are going to be signing off. This is me, the Nikhil Sai, and Alexander Olave with Jeremy Michael signing off for today. Peace. Bye-bye. Peace. Namaste.